to Josh Loveless. <clears throat> Senator Millette, Representative Cornfield, and distinguished members of the Education and Culture Affairs Committee. Good afternoon or evening as it might be now. I'm de deeply honored to be here today in front of you all. My name is Josh Lovelace and I pastor the Truth Baptist Church of Jefferson. Many of you are recognized by name through email correspondence. I would like to know this is uh, the pastor who is emailing you, letting you know that he is praying for you. I pray for all of you by name every single day. I'm asking here today and requesting that you do not pass LD 798. Let me begin, first of all, by saying my family is not anti-vaccine. We vaccinate our children, but as a pastor and part of our wonderful community in Jefferson, I can see the great suffering that would occur through the passing of this bill. Children that will not be able to attend school come September, families needing to quit their jobs, pack up, and even move away, all parishioners part of, this, of the congregation. The targeting and the segregation that this bill will present is not a direction I believe the state should go in. I am a simple-minded man. I, I do things simply. And for me, this is just a simple assault on what you and I would call religious freedom. Somebody recently testified that we are a small percentage, those that would exercise a religious liberty. And I will agree to that statement. We are a small percentage. But I do believe we need a voice as well, even though we might be small. This religious liberty is part of what you and I, what is referred to as the First Amendment to the wonderful U.S. Constitution. These liberties exist because they are not subject to be overridden by vote. To force a medical intervention or injection to be performed on someone against their religious liberty is a direct assault on that liberty. Vaccines raise a number of issues that require religious exercises. To mandate a vaccine would be unconstitutional, immoral, and to those of faith, sacrilegious. For some Muslims, because of pork, a porcine vaccine ingredients. For a Jew, because of non-kosher vaccine ingredients. For a Hindu, because of bovine ingredients. And for Christians, because of aborted fetal cell lines. To force a family to inject such ingredients into their children's bodies against their religious liberty destroys freedom at its very foundation. This assault on our communities would be detrimental to our dear families, to those of faith, and to our friends who live around us. This is not who we are, and this is not where we want to go. I respectfully request that you oppose LD 798. Thank you all for your time, and God bless each and every one of you. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. We're going to go back to Tony Brzezinski. No? Daniel Grandin Stevens. Then we're going to go to Ellen. Okay, all right. Hi, sorry about that. So I'm Danielle Grandin Stevens and I'm from Winthrop, Maine. Um, I am here in support of LD 987, but my testimony is actually in opposition of 798. So I, that's why I didn't show up the first time. I didn't know if you wanted me to do my testimony now or to wait until I'm called for that. You can do your testimony now. Okay. Am but I close? make it clear what, you, what it is you're doing to the people who are listening. Okay. Am I close enough to this that people can hear me? You're fine. Okay, thank you. Um, so I am speaking today in opposition of LD 798. As I said, my name is Danielle Grandin Stevens. I'm from Winthrop, Maine. I'm a former researcher in the field of environmental and genetic toxicology. And most importantly, I'm the mother to five beautiful, healthy, and completely unvaccinated children. Today I'd like to talk about the opposition's argument. Those for this bill would have you believe that the science is completely settled and that vaccines have been proven safe and effective over and over again. Um, I, I'm just asking if we could please see the science that settles this argument because as a researcher I can tell you I've read the science and it absolutely does not prove that vaccines are safe. Um, if vaccines were proven safe why would the US government label them clearly um, excuse me as unavoidably unsafe when granting vaccine companies indemnification. 
must be really nervous because I'm shaking, excuse me. Uh, just last month, a federal judge decided there's enough evidence that Merck committed fraud during its clinical, clinical trials and failed to warn parents of the, quote, high risks and meager benefits of Gardasil that it's allowing a trial to proceed against them. This makes two Merck vaccines in federal court for fraud at this time, uh, Gardasil and the MMR vaccine. Dr. William Thompson, a senior CDC vaccine safety scientist, has come forward with 10,000 documents that prove scientific fraud during the MMR autism study that he worked on. His documents show that the CDC knows the MMR vaccine can cause autism and forced him to destroy them. Um, his one of part of his testimony is included in my testimony. Dr. Andrew Zimmerman, a lead specialist for the government in vaccine court for an autism case one month ago stated that the government took statements he had made out of context, fired him, and continued using his statement as proof that vaccines do not cause autism. He states that in certain circumstances with a pre-existing mitochondrial disorder, they can in fact cause autism. He's accusing the Department of Justice of lying. The CDC is not interested in the actual science. There's another two doctors who have sued Mark stating they were forced to commit scientific fraud on an efficacy study for a mumps strain in the MMR vaccine, and they say that it did not have good efficacy. Merck has tried to have that thrown out of court, but the judge has ruled there is sufficient evidence to continue. We keep being told that vaccines are safe, but the science is not backing this up, and nobody's listening. We need to move forward in medicine uh, towards the future epigenetic testing, looking for mitochondrial precursors, and working on vaccine safety. Like others, I am not anti-vaccine. I am pro-safety. Only then can we move away from the one-size-fits-all model for vaccines that's not working for our entire population and move towards the future, which is individualized vaccines, individualized vaccine schedules, and restoring faith in the vaccine uh, program. Um, please consider voting against LD-798. Thank you. Are there any questions? Senator Carson. Oh. Thank you. <clears throat> when you say that you're pro-safety, how do you, how would you advise the parents of a child who has severe immune system suppression? Mm -hmm. Should they simply keep that child out of school if there is pertussis or measles or anything like that? Well, I will say that um, if you read the vaccine inserts that come with MMR, DPT, anything with a live virus in it, it actually says right on the vaccine insert that that child can carry those virus viral secretions in their lungs, um, nasal areas for up to 28 days. So I, I would propose that perhaps we keep the recently vaccinated with the live virus out of school, because that may be more dangerous to an immunocompromised. Um, and if you read through the federal argument that they just had a couple of days, they had that case, one of the amendments they made was actually to do that exact thing. It was retracted before the vote, um, but it's still listed as a suggested amendment to that. And it is on the vaccine inserts. Thank you. Any Thank other you. questions? Thank you very much. Now we're going to go to Ellen. I'm not trying to be informal. I just couldn't read your last name. That's okay. It's Stanley. <laughs> oh, just Stanley. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Should I just start? Yes, please. Okay. Good afternoon, Representative Cornfield, Cornfield, Senator Millett, and members of the Education and Cultural Affairs Committee. Walking the halls and meeting people on both sides of this issue today, there's something that was confirmed to me. And that is that every person in this room and every person in this building wants one thing and one thing only, and that's healthy children and healthy people. I'm not surprised at all by this. My name's Ellen Stanley. I'm a counselor, a certified special education teacher, and a consultant. Full disclosure, I'm not a native Mainer. I'm just a flatlander from Ohio who married a Bar Harbor boy. But in the 30 years I've lived in Maine, this is what I've observed and know in my heart to be true. Mainers are strong. Mainers are smart. Mainers think for themselves. Mainers help each other. Mainers aren't afraid to be different. And Mainers love the truth. I truly and deeply understand the concern people have about children's health. I share that concern. Trust me, I could literally talk to you all night about this, but I won't. Despite having a vaccine injured child, there are points for and against vaccination that I agree with. This is why I support informed consent and choice as well as LD 987. 
Here's my question to you, and it's four short words. Are you absolutely sure? Are you absolutely sure that this is even necessary when Maine's vaccination rates without this bill have steadily risen for the past 20 years? In other words, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Are you absolutely sure that the science you have been presented with is without bias? How do you know? Have you truly listened to families like mine who did as they were told and now live daily with vaccine injury or worse yet longing for their dead child as Susan Meehan is? Are you absolutely sure enough to deny thousands of Maine children daycare and education outside their homes, denying at least one parent the ability to work? Are you absolutely sure our schools can handle the funding loss of a mass exodus from our public schools and the possible closure of small private schools such as my daughter's? Are you absolutely sure enough to watch hundreds of families move out of the state of Maine? losing significant present and future brain trust as well as a younger work workforce. Are you absolutely sure that the state of Maine is ready to fight FAPE lawsuits after denying education to special needs students? I did what my doctor said and vaccinated my daughter. I was not given informed consent. My child was permanently harmed. Thank God I did not consent to her next set of vaccinations. They most likely would have killed her. After that appointment, my daughter was diagnosed with an extremely strong anaphylactic egg allergy. Many of the vaccines she would have received contained egg. Testing for pre-existing conditions does not, is not done before vaccine administration. My only child could have died had I not stood up to the nurse who tried to bully me into vaccinating that day. My daughter's medical team, both past and present, feel that vaccination is contraindicated for her. Even with her allergy and multiple medical conditions, she cannot legally obtain an exemption for the two vaccines required for school attendance and will be banned from her beloved school. You're banning a kid from school. If you could so I'm asking you a strong com a committee of strong independent Mainers to think for yourselves and ask yourself, are you absolutely sure? You can't be. The science isn't settled. Vote no on LD798 and vote yes are on... Are there questions for the speaker? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to take um, <coughs> Becky... <coughs> Grant, is, it, is it Grant Whedon or Whedon? Uh, G. Wyden. That's, okay, that's what. That's me. Okay. I don't mind deferring. Mine is really primarily on 798, and I don't mind waiting. I think you should go if you have the opportunity. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, if I had known, I would have had my stuff. I have. Oh, oh, to tell them. Um, it looks like Thea Embers is next. Okay. And then, I don't know which what her plan is. I don't know what her her plan is. Just one second. We're trying yeah, to yeah, figure sure. out what um, Senator Millett's plan is. Well. So let's move after you to supporting um, 798. So that would be Todd Martin, uh, Rebecca, somebody that begins with H, Matt, somebody that begins with H, Lisa Harvey um, McPherson. Yes, I know her. Um, and then Annie Graham. All right, okay. go ahead. Thank okay. you. Uh, Senator Millat, Representative Cornfield, and members of the Education and Culture Cultural Affairs Committee. My name is Becky Grant Whedon. I live in Wilton. My dad is from Fort Fairfield, so you've got a Fort Fairfield um, <laughs> connection there. Um, I am in support of LD987 and I oppose LD798. I've worked as a public health professional in Maine for 25 years. My expertise is in public health program development. I have successfully secured millions in federal, state, and local grants 
from my local hospital network, including a $1.7 million federal grant, the bulk of which benefited our local school. In the 90s, I co-wrote the white paper used by the Maine State Legislature that served as the foundation for the state's tobacco-free Maine program. The cornerstone of a solid, effective public health program is a well-developed problem or need statement, which readily provides an obvious goal. This requires a thorough exploration of the data available without sensationalized cherry picking. Here is the non-need statement for removal of non-medical exemptions. In Maine and in the U.S., overall vaccination rates have never been higher in our history. The general trend is upward. While there may be years where certain vaccine rates drop momentarily, the rates as a whole in the state and nation are on a fully upward trajectory. Maine's kindergarten vaccination rates have gone up consistently since 2000 when the rates were below 90%. Rates have been rising steadily over the past two decades and are now at 95%. Our first grade and seventh grade vaccination rates are even higher at 96.5 and 97% respectively. Maine's school vaccination rates have been at or above the national average for the past three years. Maine's overall toddler vaccination rates are also above the national average. In fact, Maine's toddler vaccination rates are in most measures higher than the three states that do not even allow non-medical exemptions. We exceed all California toddler and teen vaccination rates. If you look at data not tied to school enrollment, vaccination rates in toddlers in California actually dropped across the board with the exception of the MMR rate. Maine does not have a high vaccine exemption rate. Simply put, it is mathematically impossible to have a vaccination rate higher than the national average and claim that we also have the seventh highest exemption rate. Maine's rate is 95%. Our exemption rate is 5%. The U.S. vaccination rate is also 95%, yet the national <laughs> exemption rate is 2%. Someone's math does not add up. What this tells me is Maine school nurses do an excellent job at turning in vaccination records and exemptions, and other states have gaps. LD-798 is a solution without a problem. It is a grab at the low-hanging fruit that looks like a public health win, but will likely do very little to change overall vaccination rates, and based on California data, may result in unintended consequences of vaccine refus refusal or delay in the toddler population. I encourage you to all go online yourselves and look at the data at the CDC tool, Child VaxView, where all of this came from. You can look it up. And I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any questions? And I was under time, yay. <laughs> Representative Drinkwater. Thank you, you for your chart that you gave yeah. us, the main kindergarten immunization rates. How, how current is this one? Um, that is up to, I think it's 2017-18. So not this past year. So. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that. And that's that. all from the, the current year, yes. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that. Yep. Senator Pouliot. This last page of uh, your testimony from the John Hopkins Hospital patient information sheet talks about care at home for Im immuno immunocompromised patients. And it says, can I have visitors? And it says, tell friends and family who are sick or have recently had a live vaccine not to visit. Uh, so, I mean, d is this suggesting that people who have been vaccinated could compromise an uh, immunocompromised patient? Yes, but it gets to what um, Danielle Grondon mentioned previously in her testimony. So having people that are recently vaccinated could actually negatively impact an immunocompromised patient. Yes, with That's a live a virus twister, vaccine by the way. only. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Okay. What's Thank up? you Thank very you. much. Yes. Let me just ask before, I, I just want to make sure that I called um, Todd Martin. Okay. I'm speaking for Todd. Todd had to go pick up his child. Okay. Why don't you come and sit in the front seat? All right. Go ahead. Thank you very much. 
My testimony is in opposition to LD-798 and in support of LD-987. My name is Thea Renee Embers and I live in the town of Mount Desert. In 1962, my six-month-old sibling died eight hours after receiving a vaccine. My parents have never fully recovered from that horrible death and their loss. It's been over 50 years. When my son was born, I chose not to vaccinate him, thinking that he may have inherited a genetic predisposition. Turns out that he does have genetic issues from both my family and his dad's family. My son has been chronically ill for most of his 14 years of life. In fact, he was going to be here with me today, but he was not well enough to attend. His illness is due in part to a genetic mutation. This mutation makes it difficult for his body to detox, so anything that comes in has a difficult time going out. Chemicals, heavy metals, even his own metabolic waste, build up causing him debilitating fatigue, brain impairment, vomiting, migraines that last three days. He has literally lost years of his childhood. With the help of a team of doctors, he has regained some of his health, though his health is precarious. This year, eighth grade, has been the first year that he was well enough to attend public school. He loves it. His teachers love him. He wants to go to high school and he wants to go to college. His physicians agree that given his family history and health conditions that my son should not receive vaccinations. However, the current vaccination exemption rules are so narrow that my son would not qualify. If this bill passes, I will not be sending him to school because I will not be giving him vaccines. I would have to withdraw him and we're not sure what would happen. We are in deep debt from his medical bills and I would have to forgo working so that I could homeschool or recently, last night, we were talking about my moving home to my parents in another state so that he could attend school and that I could get a job because we need to dig out of our debt. If we do stay here and we do homeschool, then we will seek a college out of state so that he could attend college. Please protect my family from this devastating impact of this bill and oppose 798. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Todd Martin. I do have some stuff for you guys. Just put it down. Yeah, just put it down. <coughs> Good afternoon, Senator Millett, Representative Cornfield, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Education and Cultural Affairs. My name is Emily Bartlett, and I'm reading this on behalf of Todd Martin, who's reading it on behalf of Rebecca Bulos, who's the executor, Executive Director of the Maine Public Health Association. And she is out of state currently, but is available for the work session. And let's just be clear, you are speaking in support of? Uh, in support of 798. Thank you very much. Um, I grew up in Maine and currently reside in Portland. So MPHA is a professional membership organization representing nearly 750 public health professionals across Maine. Our mission is to improve and sustain the health and well-being of all Maine residents through health promotion, disease prevention, and the advancement of health equity. We are not tied to a national agenda, which means we are responsive to the needs of Maine's communities and we take that responsibility seriously. Strengthening immunization laws is one of the most effective ways to improve public health. With infectious disease outbreaks increasing across the country after being well contro controlled with vaccines for decades, this is a critical time for Maine to act. The safety, efficacy, and cost effect effectiveness of routine childhood vaccines has been well established and is supported by sound scientific studies. 
With the seventh highest school immunization exemption rate in the country, Maine cannot afford to continue to, fil to allow philosophical and re religious exemptions. And this is from the uh, CDC's morbidity and mortality report um, for children in kindergarten in 2017-2018, as we just discussed earlier. Maine has expanded vaccine access for all children by eliminating financial barriers, and our healthcare providers allow recommendations to engage families in conversations about the benefits of vaccines. Other states that have eliminated philosophical exemptions only to see their religious exemptions increase, and states that have mandated parent provider education did not see a significant reduction in opt out rates. These approaches simply aren't enough to get us where we need to be. In fact, vaccine hesitancy due to false information and myths has grown so large that the World Health Organization listed vaccine hesitancy as one of the top 10 threats to global health in 2019. Exercising a choice to vaccinate a child is dangerous. It is a choice that jeopardizes the health of the child and also other children in their families. For example, measles was declared eliminated in the U.S. in 2000, but with a decrease in immunizations, this once gone disease is now making a comeback. With one case in Maine in 2017, and so far this year in the United States, 206 confirmed cases. In January, Washington State declared a state of emergency because of a measles outbreak. Data from immunization surveys indicates that states with stronger immunization laws, like what we are proposing, have higher immunization rates and sufficient herd immunity to prevent outbreaks. All major medical and public health organizations have issued policy statements in support of eliminating, eliminating non-medical exemptions, and other states in Congress are discussing ways to strengthen immunization laws to protect and uphold the rights of all, to keep everyone safe, including those who cannot protect themselves. Vaccinations fall under the purview of public health, and when individuals' decisions impact populations, efforts to reduce the negative impacts of those decisions fall on government, on policymakers, on you. Please do your part to help protect the rights of all Mainers to attend school and work, and to thrive in communities free of vaccine-preventable diseases. We respectfully ask you to vote LD798 ought to pass. Thank you. Well, it was impressively timed. Talking fast works out sometimes. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's see. We're moving to Matt. No, is that right? Am I in the? Yep. Up here. Rebecca. Then Matt, then Lisa, then Annie. You said. Good afternoon, Senator Millett, Representative Cornfield, and members of the committee. I'm Rebecca Hemphill. I practice as an internal medicine physician with Maine Medical Partners and Maine Health. I have a general internal medicine practice in Falmouth, where I also live, and I'm the current governor of the American College of Physicians Maine Chapter, or ACP. On behalf of both Maine Medical Partners and the Maine Chapter of the ACP, I'm here to testify in support of LD-798 and in opposition to LD-987. The obvious focus of LD-798 is on the health and safety of children, but as an internist, I want to speak to the critical importance of this bill for the health and safety of the adult population of our state as well. An important preventable infectious disease that I see in my patients is pertussis, or whooping cough. We know from Maine CDC data that in 2018, there were 446 pertussis cases reported statewide compared to the five-year median of 317 reported cases. Most of these cases are in children with there are a number of outbreaks in schools. However, 10% of these cases are in adults over the age of 20. According to the U.S. CDC, pertussis vaccines are very effective, but protection d decreases over time, also known as waning immunity. Adults, including the elderly and especially those with decreased immunity, are particularly at risk during a pertussis outbreak. The incubation period for pertussis is 7 to 10 days, with the early <laughs> symptoms being mild and nonspecific, meaning that people who are infectious can be out in public places 
unknowingly exposing others, including those with decreased immunity. The most common symptom for adults with pertussis is a prolonged cough, which can be quite severe and last for weeks. Importantly, the severity of illness and risk of hospitalization is highest in patients over the age of 65 and patients with immune compromise. Additionally, I have significant concerns with LD987 because it would allow medical exemptions beyond the current standards, which do follow the US CDC standards for medical exemptions for, medical exemptions for vaccines. It is important to note that LD798 does not change the current process or standards for medical exemptions. LD-798 is important for the health of our whole community, and for that reason, I urge the committee to, su committee to support LD-798 and to oppose LD-987. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Doctor. Are there any questions for her? Yes, Representative Simpson. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So I have a quick question for you. You're talking about pertussis. Now, is pertussis um, a one of those vaccines that sheds the virus so that in a period of time after the child has been um, vaccinated, it can it can be contagious to so, others? So no. Uh, number one, pertussis is not a virus, and it is not. Uh, it is an inactivated um, component. So it is not. Uh, there is not risk uh, to others after someone has been vaccinated. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Matt, and once again, I'm not, I'm not using your last name only because I can't read it. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to just use this opportunity to um, call in Sean Goodwin, Becky Grant, Travis Grondon, Sarah Kenny, and Nick Isgro. Go ahead. All right. Good afternoon, Senator Millett, Representative Cornfield, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Education and Cultural Services. My name is Matthew Hoganauer, and I am a resident of Falmouth, Maine. Mm -hmm. I am here to testify in support of LD798 as an immunosuppressed 17-year-old with arthritis. In 2012, I was diagnosed with, H with HLEV27 positive ankylosing spondylitis, a form of inflammatory arthritis which primarily affects large joints such as the hips, knees, ankles, and shoulders. After struggling to control my disease for several years, I began using immunosuppressive TNF inhibitors, which have done an excellent job of minimizing the symptoms of my illness. However, by design, they have weakened my immune system. This makes me more susceptible to infections, and because it interferes with my immune system, it renders the vaccines that I've been lucky enough to get less effective, as evidenced by my recent contracting of or my recent contraction of pertussis. Um, I've had pertussis twice in as many years. One of those instances was just last week, and yesterday, the CDC declared an outbreak of the illness at my high school. Mm. I'm here today to express my strong support for LD-798 that, if passed, will increase immunization rates by eliminating philosophical and religious exemptions and protect people like myself whose immune systems have been compromised for one reason or another. Consider what it must be like to have a child going through immunosuppressive chemotherapy, concerned that a decision made by someone else could end their child's life. The stakes truly are life and death. Measles, for example, killed 110,000 people globally last year, according to the World Health Organization. These deaths could have been prevented had those who lost their lives been vaccinated. It is a privilege to be able to be vaccinated, and to not take advantage of this privilege is unthinkable to the hundreds of thousands who die annually because they don't have access to vaccines. LD-798 has the potential to save lives and protect people throughout the state, and I ask you to give the bill serious consideration and vote it ought to pass out of this committee. Even as a high school student, I can see how problematic it is to compromise the herd immunity that someone's child, spouse, parent or friend may need to remain healthy. Furthermore, the claims of the anti-vaccination movement have been discredited by nearly the entire scientific and medical community. On behalf of those who are at risk, children who are not vaccinated and those like me who are put at risk by low vaccination rates, I implore you to support LD-798. And I ask each and every one of you, will you protect me and the people like me across the state? 
Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. I feel bad that we made you sit in this crowd so long. <laughs> any questions? Thank you very much. Great, thank you for your time. Good evening, Senator Mellett, Representative Cornfield, and members of the Education and Cultural Affairs Committee. My name is Lisa Harvey McPherson, and I'm here today to testify in support of 798, representing Northern Lighthouse and our member organizations. The first component of my testimony talks about Northern Light Health as a health system serving patients from Portland, Maine, to the Canadian border. 93% of Maine's population is served by our organization. We also employ over 12,000 people making Northern Light Health one of Maine's largest employers. You've had excellent testimony tonight from a variety of physicians. I'm not going to focus on the aspect of immunizations for children. I'm going to speak about something you haven't discussed tonight. I'm going to speak about the aspects of the bill and the impact of the bill on employees of healthcare facilities that are subject to the main CDC rules requiring immunization proof. Healthcare employees employed by facilities must have on file proof of immunization to rubella, mumps, rubiola, varicella, and hepatitis B. We too have the same exemptions, religious, philosophical, and medical. I am speaking in support of this bill and the impact that this bill would have to limit that exemption for healthcare employees to medical purposes. But I must emphasize to you we need time. We will need time to transition our employees who have the current exemptions that are religious and philosophical to be able to continue to practice while we implement the new law. In my testimony, I recommend grandfathering existing employees. That may or may not be the right choice. But I want to work with you during your work session to be able to transfer the 299 individuals in our health system who will need the opportunity to continue employment while the new law is being implemented to limit the exemption to medical purposes only. And with that, I welcome any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. The Honorable A Annie Graham. Yes, good evening. It's an honor to be here. Um, good afternoon, uh, Senator Millette and Representative Cornfield and the honorable members and hardworking members of the Joint Standing Committee on Education and Cultural Services. My name is Ann, Ann Graham, or Annie, as my friends and family call me. Um, I am a resident of North Yarmouth, and I am here to testify in support of LD 798 as a mom of three young adult sons, a pediatric nurse practitioner, uh, with, um, and a former member of the main house. My experience includes public health nursing, pediatric neurology, including care for children with autism, epilepsy, and developmental delay. Thank you for this opportunity to come before you on a matter I hold very dear to my heart, keeping all of our children healthy. Many thanks to Representative Tipping and his co-sponsors for bringing this bill forward. No matter where you come down on the, this issue, I know we all love our children. My life's work has been devoted to caring for children and their families by preventing disease and harm. Immunizing our children is one of the most effective ways to keep all of us well. I began my pediatric nurse practitioner journey at a large pediatric practice across from Children's Hospital in Boston. To this day, I remember a little girl. She was three years old, and I'll call her Jenny. She contracted H-flu meningitis. She was extremely ill, and her hospital treatment was intensive. Her entire child care center was treated with prophylactic antibiotics. Jenny survived uh, the disease, but was rendered deaf. Jenny would be in her 30s now, and maybe a mom herself. We had no vaccine for H. flu meningitis then, but we do now. Do you think Jenny's parents would have chosen to immunize their child to prevent the damage that resulted in lifelong challenges? Do you think that Jenny immunizes her child? I suggest they would. We are the victim 
as many people have said, of our own public health success. We don't see the devastating results of a disease such as polio or smallpox. Will we choose to have our children, all of our children, suffer from severe illness that we could have prevented? Will we choose to not put our child in a car seat because we don't think we'll be in an accident that day? Will we choose to have our child not wear a belt bike helmet because we have taught them to be safe? I will choose the car seat, I will choose the bike helmet, and I will choose vaccines to protect my child, my children, and all of our children. I will fight to keep my children, your children, and grandchildren safe from illness and even death. I res uh, respect uh, respectfully recommend that you may want to look at amending this bill um, around medical exemptions, um, but only if that's based on clear science. I leave you with this. Here's a lyric from a Carpenter's song called Bless the Beast and the Children. For in this world they have no choice, they have no voice. I thank you for this opportunity to share my passion on this important bill with you today. I thank you for your, the work that you do every day for the people of Maine. I get it, I miss it, and I appreciate all that you're doing today for us. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. I'm not sure where you went to next. Here now. Here. Good morning. Okay. Um, is it Sharon? Sharon? Goodwin. Goodwin? Goodwin? Somebody by the last name of Goodwin. We can't read the first name. No? Nope. Okay. Sharon or Sean or... Okay. Becky Grant? Sharon came up. Okay. Travis Grandin. I just wanted to let you know that I had a block. Oh, thank you, Vers. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Sarah Kenny. Sarah Kenny. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, before we begin, uh, I'd like to call in Marley Jacksman, Morgan Titus Ran from Vassalboro. <laughs> Karen Goldberg, Anna Courtney, and Meg Osgood. Okay, let's go ahead. Good afternoon, Senator Millett, Representative Cornfield, and distinguished members of the Education and Cultural Affairs Committee. My name is Sarah Kenny, and I live in Orono. My husband and I have three children, ages 19, 16, and 13. We moved to this state 15 years ago. We started a high-tech consulting business 23 years ago, and when Maine was offering the Pine Tree Zone tax incentive, we moved our business here. Our clients are all over the country, so we can live anywhere. We absolutely love Orno, and it has served our family well. We have been active members of the community since moving to Orno. My husband and I served on numerous boards and committees. I served on the Orno Library Foundation for nine years, and we were responsible for building Orno's first freestanding public library. My husband spent 10 years on the school board and also on the school consolidation committee. We have also organized and coached youth sports for the past 15 years. We truly care about each and every child and want to make a difference. I am particularly proud that as a small business owner, we provide high paying jobs for our seven employees and offer full health insurance. In the past 15 years, our, our small business has brought over $7 million of revenue into the state of Maine, all from out-of-state clients. We are net importer, uh, importers of jobs for the state of Maine. But at the end of the day, the most important thing to my husband and I are our children. We have worked so hard to build a wonderful life for them. We thoughtfully consider each and every decision when it comes to their health and especially when it comes to vaccines. Our world was rocked when we were made aware of LD-798. The kids love their schools, their friends, their sports teams, and they are thriving. If this bill passes, we will be strongly considering homeschooling or moving to another state that offers vaccine choice. I ask you to please oppose this bill. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, all right, Nick Isgrove. Senator Millett, Representative Cornfield, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here and speak to you about this today. Uh, my name is Nick Isgro. I live in the city of Waterville with my wife, Amanda, and our five children, all of whom, by the way, would not be affected um, should this new law pass. Uh, my children have been immunized. Back in 2014, I became involved in public service, involved in politics, because after watching government for many years, it became apparent to me that often too many voices were not heard in the halls of government or in the ears of politicians. I wanted to try and give those people a voice and give a voice to the little guy. It seemed clear to me how far we have strayed from the most basic principles of our government, the right to personal liberty, the right to practice our religious faith without being subject to the heavy hand of government. Where we live, our rights are guaranteed. They are not subject to the passing of 51% of a vote. Now, while these reasons for serving the public I have outlined might seem idealistic, I wanted to put my words into action. So I stand before you today as the mayor of the city of Waterville. I've been moved to be here today because every reason that I just listed for getting involved in politics demands that I be here today to oppose LD 798. In the city of Waterville, it weighs heavily upon me to think about the moms and dads that are going to have reached out, wondering what they're going to say to their children when they are ripped from their schools, ripped from their community. Children of my community have been, are going to be told that as they are isolated and segregated from their teachers and friends, that they are dangerous or somehow dirty. I think about the teachers who know these students personally. In some cases, these students are their classroom leaders. What, the, what are they to say to the students being torn from their classrooms? And what will they say to the students that are going to get left behind, watching their close friends and playmates banished away in isolation, away from the school? I think history proves it's a dangerous path we're going down where we're going to demean, segregate, and isolate certain members of our society. Uh, once our laws have erroneously labeled unvaccinated children as dangerous and dirty, and driven from public schools, what comes next? Will they be banned from public libraries, from playgrounds? How about restaurants, businesses, maybe sports teams? Where will this line get drawn? And have any of you asked yourselves these questions? I hope you have. As mayor of a city, I worry about good families who live in my community. They pay taxes. They add to our local economies. Who will move away if this measure passes? This will happen. And it won't just happen in Waterville. Families will move away from around the state. You've heard a lot of testimony today. These people take it seriously. What we can't measure is all the good families that will never move here in the future because uh, this measure would pass. You know, we are forced to inject our children with any substance against our will. We are no longer living in a free country. Our Constitution and Bill of Rights, with things like that, things like informed consent and freedom to exercise our religion are not subject to a majority vote. In fact, the very essence of a constitutional republic is that it protects the rights of minorities. Every one of us that holds elected office has a moral duty to do just that. I feel like I'm doing my part by being here today in opposition to this bill, LD 798. I hope each of you take to heart this testimony and vote against this bill. Um, may I ask you, you use City of Waterville stationery. Are you speaking for yourself or the, your position as mayor of the City of Waterville? I am speaking uh, both for myself and as mayor of the City of Waterville. However, my city council has not voted on this. I am here independently, but I also was independently elected. Any questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, we're moving on now to Marley Jackson. Good evening, esteemed committee members. 
My name is Marley Saxman. I'm a naturopathic physician and speech language pathologist who practices in Ellsworth, Maine. And I am speaking this evening in opposition of LD 798 and support of 987. My testimony was emailed to you. As a naturopathic doctor licensed in the states of both Maine and Vermont and currently practicing in Maine, I joined my fellow colleagues of the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons in opposition of mandated vaccines. In the late 1990s and the first decades in 2000, I worked as an early intervention specialist for the state of Maine. As a licensed speech language pathologist, I contracted with Maine State Child Development Services. Frequently, I was one of the first providers to evaluate an infant, toddler, or young child with developmental disabilities. A large number of those young children had experienced months or even years of healthy, typical development before suddenly they found themselves ill and with numerous developmental delays. Frequently, there was a sudden and rapid loss of development that had been, had been progressing normally, speech and motor skills, social development, and behavior. Often, new behaviors of withdrawal and isolation, nonstop crying, lack of interest in food, significant GI upset and repetitive behaviors accompanied the arrested previously normal development. It was all too common when interviewing the distraught parents of these children who had suddenly changed to find that frequently within days prior to the arrested development and sudden health declines, the child had received a vaccine. Many of these children never recovered fully and faced a lifetime of specialized support and medical care. This pattern has such a profound impact on me that in 2010, I closed my practice as a speech-language pathologist and chose to go to naturopathic medical school in order to better understand what had rendered these children vulnerable and how to protect them and attempt to recover their development, health, and well-being. Since a medical exemption that we currently have in the state only really is an exemption if a child has already had a vaccine injury, if the injury has already taken place, the philosophical and religious exemption currently in debate is the only protection that remains for the infants and children with compromised genetics, immune systems that are compromised, and detoxification capacities that are also uh, in compromised capacity. It renders them potentially vulnerable to severe health and developmental complications after the vaccine. Vaccines do not undergo the rigorous testing and trials of pharmaceutical medications. It's essential that we allow for individual choice and protection for those who may well be damaged as a result of receiving a vaccine. Given that the United States government has paid over $4 billion for vaccine-related injuries, it's clear that for some, there is devastating and profound risk. I urge you to vote against LD-798. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank, Thank you. you. Morgan? And Morgan, I noticed that you're signed up as well on another um, sheet. Is, are you going to be testifying for both right now? I can do both right now. That might be good for you and your I would love one. that. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Morgan Titus Rao. I'm a naturopathic doctor and a certified professional midwife in Vassalboro, Maine. And I'm nervous. <laughs> I've been in practice for 13 years. I was born and raised in Maine. I was educated at the University of Maine at Orno and went off to medical school and came back to have my family and start my practice. And my hope was that my, my children would do the same. Uh, I'm here to uh, oppose LD-798 because where there is risk, there must be choice. And medical ethics are violated by this bill. If this bill becomes law, you remove the aspect of autonomy. <coughs> Patients do not have the right to self-determination if their choices become limited to the point of one choice. <clears throat> LD-798 directly removes this right. Um, it's the duty of law to protect patients and students' rights, not to remove them. Uh, LD-798 forces our children into a clinical trial. The clinical trials that were referred to previously are our children. They don't happen at the pharmaceutical industry. There's no incentive to do so except the philosophical and religious exemptions. When people take those, that is an incentive for vaccine manufacturers to improve their product. There is no other incentive. <coughs> 
So uh, my feeling is that um, LD798 will not improve the rates of vaccination in Maine. We're not seeing that in California since the mandates were um, begun there. It's only going to serve to alienate people that wish to make educated decisions uh, with their health care providers. Um, uh, much of my testimony has already been stated by other people, so I'm trying to cut to the chase, but I, I, am, I am appalled by the number of health care practitioners that are here supporting the bill to remove informed choice for patients. That is a, a primary tenet of medical ethics, that our patients should have the opportunity to discuss benefits and risks and make decisions on their own. And if we remove those options, we, um, we're not the state that I... I thought we were. So uh, I do ask that um, you support LD 987 to expand the medical exemptions because we've got to get with the times. The medical exemptions that are in place right now are for only injured children or children that have a known anaphylactic reaction to a vaccine ingredient. And so if we don't expand the medical exemptions to help children that have a risk for vaccine injury, then we're doing a disservice to our children. So, uh, in summary, when our children are used in a medical experiment, according to the Nuremberg trials and the Nuremberg law, there must be informed choice. This is a, an unethical abuse of power. I urge you to oppose LD-798 and to, regardless of what happens with 798, expand the medical exemptions because we need to, we need to flush out the the rules that apply for that exemption specifically, but we also need to keep the philosophical and religious exemptions in place. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, you did ha you were signed up in support of 987. Yes. Um, but you didn't speak to that at all. In, in expanding the medical exemptions. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Great. Uh, Karen? And Ms. Goldberg, I notice you also are yes. signed up. Are you going to testify again yes. or is this? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> One and done. Thank you guys. Good evening, Representative Millett, Representative or Representative Cornfield, sorry, Senator Millett, and the committee. My name is Karen Goldberg and my husband Lee and I live in South Portland. Our children have been in the public school system for 17 years. If this bill passes, they will be forced to leave. I oppose LD 978 and I support LD Eight, sorry, 987. For our children, we have fully, partially, and not vaccinated depending on the child. Our son who is active duty has been fully vaccinated, but our 15-year-old is only partially vaccinated. He has a genetic condition that made brain surgery necessary, as well as other debilitating conditions. He currently sees multiple specialists, and even with all of that, we use the philosophical exemption because we have not been given a medical exemption. In 2015, Representative Linda Sanborn testified for LD 471, quote, it strikes me as unfair to remove the philosophical exemptions for vaccines when at the same time informing parents that there are possible adverse reactions to the vaccine, unquote. She also states, we must respect the parent's decision. Presently, our 15-year-old has a 504 plan with, and without public school, he would not receive these services and his education would be nearly impossible. If you remove all of the non -part or partially vaccinated students like our children, you will not create a public school system that is free of disease. It's a promise that is misleading. You cannot hold a child's education hostage. In 2012, chickenpox went around our school, removing the non and partially vaccinated children did not stop the chickenpox. It continued to make the rounds in the vaccinated who got to stay in school while our healthy children stayed home for over 50 days. We all want healthy children. We must allow the freedom to make medical decisions that are tailor-made for each child because all bodies are biologically different. Representative Sanborn also stated that the, quote, solution lies in trying to search for possible links to genetic or environmental causes that predispose those of us who have more serious adverse reactions to vaccines so we can understand specifically who needs to be medically exempted, end quote. That information isn't always available, and that is why we have made the informed decision not to continue with vaccination across the board. 
Recently, in an interview on WGME, Dr. Dora Mill stated it is much easier to not vaccinate a child than to vaccinate, and this is simply not true. Exhaustive research and care goes into the decisions we and our children's doctors are making. As Dr. Laura Blaisdell testified in LD 471 in 2015, there is no one vaccine decision that is right for all people. Our children thrive in public school. Is Maine really going to round up and isolate a large group of children and force them to leave their place of belongingness? What will that do to the mental health of those currently happy, settled children? Is Maine ready for that fallout? Representative Ralph Tucker testified for LD 606 stating, returning to school was an essential morale booster during his daughter's time with cancer. Doesn't my son deserve the same school community support? This bill discriminates against children with medically complex conditions who have a right to lawful accommodations to access their education. For these reasons, I strongly oppose LD 798 and support 987. And I urge you all to do the same. Thank you. Sorry Thank for you. going over. No, it's are, are there any questions? You wrapped up nicely. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.